So thank you all, first of all. I know this is a very busy time for you all to, to, uh, to come by the, this our booth and, and hear what we have to say about Cryptococcus. And uh, hopefully I'll tell you a story that I think is really, really exciting. And we have the opportunity to really do some amazing things, uh, both in the United States, but particularly in developing countries. Um, so I'll start by, there we go. Um, about 600,000 people die of cryptococcosis every year, which when you look at the numbers in a little bit more depth, um, that's about 1,700 every uh, month, and then about 70 every day, and that happens today, it's gonna happen tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that. Tremendous burden of disease. In fact, uh, it's thought that in Sub-Saharan Africa that more patients, HIV patients, die of, of cryptococcosis than tuberculosis. Now this is contrary to what many, many people uh, have been talking about and what you would see in the literature. Uh, yeah, that said the same thing. And that was a recent CDC publication by um, ben Park and Tom Chiller and many people show this slide and this shows the prevalence of uh, HIV in different areas of the world and really you can superimpose wherever HIV is that's the same place where cryptococcosis is and you can see it's it's the mainly a problem in sub-saharan Africa but then also in South and Southeast Asia I like to look at it a little bit differently and if you multiply those prevalence numbers by populations, this is the way the map turns out. And so it shows you that the main burden of this disease happens to be in Sub-Saharan Africa and a huge problem in India, um, whereas, but in India the prevalence is not that high. It's a lot like it is in the United States, it's just there's so many people. <coughs> the, Another problem with this disease is, is the burden that it has on, um, on orphans. If we can keep the kids alive, who would have, keep the mothers alive rather, who would have otherwise died of cryptococcosis, we have the opportunity to prevent hundreds of thousands of orphans. And this is a little bit deeper into the, the CDC data for where they're looking at excluding HIV, but you look at these different disease categories like malaria, diarrheal diseases, this childhood cluster of diseases, well there's cryptococcosis in the top four. I mean that's a, that's a big thing that's come out recently and it's put cryptococcus on the map. And, and there's lots of people that are working on strategies to improve patient outcomes. So what's being done? Despite um, lots of efforts and, and Diflucan has been generously provided by Pfizer free of charge for decade uh, or more rather and to the tune of, a, of over a billion dollars Pfizer has donated uh, to this cause uh, since 2000 we're talking 63 different countries and uh, let's see over 35 million doses of Diflucan which is freely available to these the poorest of the world so with that in mind, I mean, that's a, such a generous effort. Why is there such a burden of disease? And what we see is that it's all in diagnosis. These patients are dying because they come to these ART or antiretroviral therapy clinics late in the course of disease. Let me paint a picture. These patients are coming, they might have a CD4 count of 20, and they come in with cryptococcal antigen titers in their cerebral spinal fluid, one to a million. 30-day uh, mortality in these patient populations is between 60 and 70 percent. Huge problem. So what we need to do is we need to diagnose the disease earlier. And really I'm going to tell you a little bit about this new dipstick test that I think does one very, very simple thing. What it does is it connects a symptomatic patient with the right, with Diflucan. That's all that this little test does and we provide it affordably to those who need it most. Well, so what, how, what's the course of disease? You normally inhale the organism, it then disseminates hematogenously and ends up in your brain causing meningitis. Well, you can detect using cryptococcal antigen, you can detect meningitis 
well before it ever turns into meningitis. And here's a, a typical time course. If you're infected at time zero, you start as a asymptomatic pulmonary infection. And at that point in time, mainly just your bronchoalveolar lavage fluid would be positive. But then as the, the organism starts to disseminate and becomes extra pulmonary, then you start to see urine becomes positive for cryptococcal antigen. You start to see serum and plasma start to become positive. And then ultimately you end up with symptomatic meningitis with these very high titers of antigen in their cerebral spinal fluid. That's a bad scenario for these patients. But if we can diagnose these patients earlier in the course of disease, we can put them on therapy that are uh, therapies that are much more effective. And our goal as a company is very simple. It's that. We want to save lives, period. And we want to do it around the world. We want to do it here in the United States. Um, there's cryptococcosis patients right here in San Francisco, and they're just as important to us as those cryptococcosis patients that are in Uganda. The challenges are different, as you'd imagine, between here and Uganda. Currently, lots of labs do India ink staining. Um, it's a very simple test, very inexpensive test. However, that test uh, has high false positive problems and false negative problems. It does require some training, and training is a hard hurdle to overcome in Sub-Saharan Africa. Culture uh, is also available, and it's the gold standard. Then you have latex agglutination. That's the test that's been around for uh, since the 50s, I believe. Uh, and then you have ELISAs, so a high volume type test platforms. But all of these tests have, have their inherent problems and can cause false negative reactions. I learned this simple lesson, keep it simple, uh, when I was on a training, I was, in, I was doing a training workshop in Tanzania and I realized and I was training uh, laboratory scientists and clinicians how to run cryptococcal latex test, which in the U.S. is the mainstay for cryptococcal antigen testing. By our standards, it's simple, it's fast, it's easy, but by African standards, it's difficult. Um, they, you're dealing with different problems. Access to water to rehydrate a reagent is a difficult uh, step. Having to maintain cold chain, having freezers and refrigerators. And so this was literally a sign um, at a place I went to in, in Tanzania and I took a picture of it and I thought this is what we want to do. We want to have a test that requires less training, less materials, less time, just quick results. Um, and the idea is these patients uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it might be a, uh, difficult for them to attend a clinic. And so we wanted to, for them to be able on the same visit to be diagnosed and leave with their treatment. And that was an important hurdle that we needed to overcome. And we believe we've done this by building the cryptococcal antigen lateral flow test. It's a simple dipstick test um, that is WHO uh, recommended. That's the World Health Organization and it's FDA cleared. And it's, it, it is absolutely simple. I have my two daughters, 12 and 9, have both run this assay and they can do it with competence. Uh, I tested the, the pictorial instructions on them and, and they can do it. Um, five easy steps, 10 minutes, no specimen processing. Um, it's, it, it really is as easy as five steps. Um, as I mentioned, the World Health Organization recommended the CRAG LFA. And in addition to recommending that for diagnosis, their recommendation also included um, the potential for screening. So what does this look like? The idea is that if we catch these patients early when they're asymptomatic, we can put them on therapy earlier. So how do you do that? Well, most of the patients um, that develop cryptococcosis have CD4 counts of 100 or less. And so the idea is we'll screen these patients for cryptococcal antigen and if they're CRAG positive, then we're gonna put them on the right therapies. And WHO said, well, it needs to be a CRAG prevalence rate of 3% or greater. 
Um, just to kind of put that in perspective, uh, a study just came out from Uganda that looked at what is the CRAG prevalence in HIV patients with a CD4 count less than 100. Um, 22%. 22% of their HIV patients have cryptococcal antigen in their blood at a CD4 count of 100 or less. It's a tremendous undiagnosed problem. In addition, the CDC has, um, has, is promoting our test. And they're not doing it by name, but you won't see any other tests like this out there. But this has been a, an important public-private partnership um, that we've formed with the US CDC that we're out trying to train laboratory scientists throughout the world. And you know, if, if we can detect these patients at the beginning, we can prevent meningitis. It's affordable, it's cost effective. Um, a number of different cost effectiveness studies have been done. And at a prevalence rate of about 20%, it literally costs about $17 to save one life. I mean, it's very cost effective and it's life-saving. Well, the CDC has a call to action, and by 2015, they want to equip half of all clinics in Africa and Asia with, for cryptococcal testing, and this could save 50,000 to 100,000 lives this year and next year and the year after that. And the other thing that's, I mentioned the orphan problem, if we can keep the moms alive who would have otherwise died of this disease, we can prevent on the order of 200 to 400,000 orphans every year. And you imagine what that burden is on society to have to, to take care of all those kids. We'd rather mom do it, right? <laughs>